Okay. Don't say anything bad. Tag team off the ropes. <laughs> Okay, so we're good to go. Yeah. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Parker. Uh, we're here presenting about uh, enhancing password-based uh, key derivation techniques. Uh, I work with Zetetic, um, based out of Iowa. And uh, my name is Stephen Lombardo, also with Zetetic, and uh, based out of New Jersey. There we go. <clears throat> So one of the projects that uh, we work on, spend a lot of time on, is, is SQL Cipher. Is anyone, just to get a feel for the room, is anyone familiar with SQL Cipher at all? Okay, a few. Um, also, SQLite, is that? Okay, so a few people are familiar. So SQL Cipher is based on SQLite. Uh, it's an open source extension uh, to SQLite that provides full database encryption. Um, so, you know, saying that SQL, SQLite is uh, an embedded database, and so it has a very large platform target, you know, if you will. So if you, if you want to look at the, the different languages and, and uh, platforms that it would run on, uh, we, we basically operate on, on, on many of those. Uh, you know, C, C++, I'm not, I won't read the whole list, but um, there's a good chance that if you develop in that, uh, that SQL Cipher is going to run on that platform. So uh, we we often find ourselves with kind of a broad spectrum of users that uh, that use that uh, for various means. Um, they both operate in the mobile and desktop space. Um, but our focus today is specifically on securing user data, where the user provides a portion of the key material. So. We're just going to take a quick look, a high level, of how SQL Cipher works. Um, so there's transparent interaction as a, as a client developer. You don't have to deal with any of the encryption, the decryption process. It all happens on the fly. So it's a, you have a client uh, database API that you'll consume, and everything just works. You provide the, the passphrase, and you get your data based on your queries that you operate on. When you insert data, we, we store that, we encrypt it for you automatically. <clears throat> it's on the fly. So in other words, the entire file is encrypted. However, if you uh, are querying for a certain portion of data out of your file, uh, it, it'll only decrypt the amount of data that it needs to retrieve that for you. We have a crypto provider system, so structured. Uh, within the library itself uh, allows us to swap out different crypto providers. By default, we use OpenSSL. Um, we've ported that then to use Common Crypto for, for iOS, as an example, and then Lib TomCrypt for other platforms where OpenSSL isn't uh, appropriate. Uses a, we use a standard KDF, PBKDF2. Um, and so historically, you know, sometimes people will ask us why, you know, why why don't you use other uh, key derivation approaches? You know, S crypt has become a very popular, uh, you know, approach, and SQL Cipher predates S crypt. So to to visualize the structure of how data is stored, um, every database when it's created gets a a unique per database salt, and then the the, the actual database stores these like opaque blocks of data in pages. And so you've got your encrypted block, a, a, uh, a unique initialization vector, and then a Mac for the data. Can everyone hear me okay? I kind of keep coming in and out. Yeah. So, so with kind of with that said, I, I want to take a step back and look at how how SQL Cipher has evolved over the years. Okay, so when we initially released it, we had a, a iteration length of 4,000 in it, as it relates to uh, computing the key through PBKDF2. And just recently, I think uh, it's maybe a little over a year ago, we we switched, we upgraded the library and changed it so that it used 64,000 iterations. 
<clears throat> you'll note that uh, while we did timings, you know, on various devices when we when we made those initial uh, configurations, and then when we we upgraded, there they were they were still you know somewhat arbitrary. You know, we we verified that they didn't take too long. They were still arbitrary. So what we looked at is you know maybe we can we can do things better. And so we think we have two approaches that that are applicable in the context of SQL Cipher. So the first one is an adaptive key derivation approach, and the second one is multi-factor hardware token integration. Okay, so I'm gonna put the mic down for a split second. If you can't read that, uh, so this this story kind of predates. It goes back a couple years, uh, two years ago. I was down in in Brazil and I had a conversation with um, Jacob Applebaum, and he kind of came up and we were talking about SQL Cipher, and he he mentioned that you know, hey, I've got a Android G1. It's a it's a fairly old device. Um, it doesn't have a lot of computing power, but I have a new Android device that's much better, and it would be fantastic if you could take an approach that you don't use a static key derivation, you know, work factor um, and, and actually take advantage of the hardware that I have. So that kind of got us thinking and, you know, we got busy um, like everyone does, uh, but, but we've, we've, we've taken that to heart. So let's just take a look at you know what are, what are the, some of the, some of the problems that we have with the static uh, KDF length, right? Um, you know both desktop. You know m most of the time, how many how many of us here develop for multiple platforms, both desktop and hardware or and, and mobile devices, right? So the hardware specs on those vary drastically, right? Okay, the technology continues to evolve over time, right? Uh, iPhones are able to take advantage of GPU acceleration when they when they deal with crypto primitives, um, and and the reality is is that while we have you know tools like Hashcat that that can um, do amazing things, uh, there are different security requirements for different types of applications. The user experience may change, right? So um, you know you may be dealing with highly sensitive data, and and a wait time of maybe ten seconds is appropriate when accessing data, whereas other applications may need to be more snappy. So if we look at the uh, adaptive KDF goals and kind of frame this in the context of PBKDF2 as it relates to what, what our goal is, we'd like to, to provide fast sampling across all platforms. So even on that G1 device, we would like it to be just as fast, relatively speaking. Um, we want to be able to compute the ideal work factor and limit it by time, right? Because ultimately, we don't want to have to take into account the various hardware components that might play into how it would operate. And we would allow, like to allow that sampling to occur on any of our platforms that we support. So what we came up with is, is an approach to allow the computation of the KDF to run automatically on the device. It's constrained by time. We have a default value. And it's tunable. So what we're looking at here is just an example from the, the SQL Cypher command shell, allowing you to interact with the K KDF computation routine. So here's just three examples where we initialize a, a database, we'll key the database, and then we ask it to compute a KDF work factor. Now these are all run on a, on a MacBook Pro 2.3 gigahertz device. And in the default situation where we run for one second, I was able to compute just a little over a million iterations. In, in the scenario again, you know, where, where I, I allow for two seconds to compute, I get a little over 2.2 .2 million. 
And if I constrain it down to, say, half a second, it's, it's 575,000 iterations. So that's, you know, just in, in, in reviewing that, that's, a, that's quite, quite a spectrum of change from our static value that we, we've had before. <clears throat> so here's just a table of various devices where we've sampled across hardware and simulators, emulators, and phones. And you can see that while there are some devices like the Android emulator are, are you know, somewhat close to what our static values are, um, you know, all, all, the, all the various devices, there's, we're, we're really doing a disservice to users in not taking advantage of the hardware that's available to them by using a static key or a static work factor. That's for one second. So when we, when we start talking about, you know, computing a work factor on a per device basis, kind of introduces a new set of challenges that we didn't have to deal with before. Previously, we had a static key, or a, not a static key, excuse me, a static uh, iteration length. Um, and, and so the client developer wasn't responsible for, for maintaining that. Um, but now, any application that consumes this would have to track what that work factor value is in order to be able to you know, access the database again. So persisting the KDF work factor becomes important. Can't you store it with the database? We can, in fact, and that leads us to our next slide. Yep, it's a very good question, very poignant. <clears throat> so, so visually we've got two, we've got two pictures going on. I'm gonna describe the first, the, the far right picture first. So uh, SQLite has a, has a series of layers um, and the, at, at the very bottom layer, they implement what's called a virtual file system. So it's their abstraction layer to interop with various operating systems um, with reading and writing of files, et cetera. And so we have a new SQL Cipher virtual file system that acts as like a facade around the underlying virtual file system and allows us to control writing a header which will persist the information that's relevant to us. So a computed KDF work factor on device would automatically be stored within the database file itself. Um, everything else continues to remain the same as the previous example gave where we get the database salt and then our pages of data. So it essentially gives us a means to have an offset point. So, you know, kind of forget about all this data, start here instead of here. No, so historically, uh, SQL Cipher will ship with defaults, uh, default KDF uh, work, fact, uh, you know, work factor lengths, default ciphers, um, page sizes, um, and all those things are, are adjustable from a client library perspective. So um, you can, you had two options essentially. You could use the defaults, which is generally what, what people would do or what we would recommend. And the other option was to change them. And if you change them, the client was responsible for supplying what those values were uh, before you interacted with it. So you, you would, uh, you know, open your connection to the database, supply your configuration parameters, and then interact with it. So does this new header include all of that stuff now? The client's no, the client's no longer responsible for remembering this? Right. <clears throat> so the, the question, if, if this new header includes all of that information, uh, yes and no. Uh, so this is, a, this is an experimental branch right now. Um, we have uh, almost all of that information stored. Um, however, some of that information we would, we, there's more information that we'd like to include in that header. Uh, so it's not finalized yet, but it's but it's pretty close. So the the idea here is to make it as simple as possible for the client developer to consume the library and still take advantage of 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 being able to compute a, a new work factor. So if we kind of take a look at you know the pros and cons of of being able to compute a, an adaptive work factor. You know, 
the pro here is that we get a sample across all all platforms. We can constrain it by time, right? So it's 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 consistent by time, which is really from an end user's perspective, what's you know important whether or not they have access, you know, within a half of a second or ten seconds. And and we can sample that across all devices. Uh, PBKDF2 being, you know, our 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 computation routine focuses strictly on doing a, a linear calculation. So the cons is uh, cross device performance. So what that means is, um, you know, for example, with Jacob Applebaum, he has his G1 and he has a a new Android device, and the work factor is going to be dramatically different between those two devices. So, um, or, you know, if you take my, my MacBook Pro, I can compute a very high work factor. And then if I try and interact with that database on a device that has poor hardware performance, the time at that point does not, is not, does not scale well. This also introduces additional complexity within the SQL Cipher code base. So that, that onus falls on us. Absolutely. So, so the question is, if, if we watch for system load, um, uh, to answer that, yes and no. Uh, so there are certain environments um, in particular. So SQL Cipher runs on, on Android, on, on the Android platform. And uh, one, one of the things that we've seen um, over time, and, it, and it's, I, I don't know if it, I, I think it's specific to the, to the Android platform, but it's also maybe partially related to the client library in terms of how things work. You've got a, a Java layer, a JNI interop layer, you know, and then a native layer. And so there's there's a lot of things that are kind of at play, and so we've seen scenarios where um, you know opening a connection to a database where and and th that first operation where it actually has to derive the key can take considerably longer, and the the fact that you have devices that have a, a very broad spectrum of of, uh, of of behaviors in terms of of how what they support, um, we. You know, you you do see things like that. Um, generally speaking, I would say you you don't um, on other platforms. But part of but based on that is we use the information that we've seen as we profile it to determine what kind of what our default recommendation is uh, for the default time period. Because uh, so we we al I also work on Strip, which is a, a cross platform uh, password data manager, and so. We experience those same things as well um, in terms of the performance um, and that user experience. So, um, you know, but again, it's it's tunable, I guess, to to the environment that you put it in. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Our solutions and the things we've run up against. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it. Anybody else? Or we can take questions later too, or offline. So. Thanks, Nick. All right. So the the next thing that we started to take a look at with, um, you know, kind of enhancing our standard key derivation functions, um, is how how we might be able to integrate. Uh, a multi-factor scenario where uh, getting access to a database is no longer just about one factor, which is, is the passphrase that you know, but there's also the requirement to present something that you have, uh, something on your person, and that, that would be a hardware token. So stepping back uh, briefly here, got... No? Okay. So uh, stepping back, we've got uh, our current 
PBKDF, right, which is PBKDF2. And the inputs to this function are essentially the, the database key, which is provided by the user, and that's the passphrase. And we have this random database salt, which we store, as you saw from the, the picture that Nick talked about, we store it right at the, at the front of the file. Um, and that's generated randomly for every individual database that's created. And then we have this new adaptive work factor. And those all get combined, passed into, into uh, PBKDF2 to generate our encryption key, which is actually used to, to encrypt the page data. So what we'd ideally um, like to do is say, well, how can we add a you know, hardware token to the mix? And we have some requirements for it. So ideally, we want something to meet our requirements that would work offline. So there's a lot of sort of going, going back to the previous talk about what is authentication versus encryption. There's a lot of multi-factor authentication solutions out there. You've got, you know, TOTP, you've got, you know, U YubiKey has one, there's, you know, a variety of them. But one of the key things that is pretty important is there's always another party that's doing authentication. Typically you have to have some sort of network connectivity. And we really don't want to put that requirement in for a system like SQL Cipher, where there may be requirements, specific requirements for offline data access, um, or maybe you don't really trust any other parties to do authentication. So that, that's really a critical one. And that leads us to, you know, how do we interface with the hardware token? And we'd like it to be something simple, you know, USB ideally. Um, in the best case scenario, the tokens would be very widely available. So, uh, you know, something that you could really go out and buy, um, you know, kind of a commodity product um, and one that provides onboard crypto so that we're not, you know, introducing yet more complexity into the SQL Cipher database. Uh, and since we're going to be doing some sort of, you know, some sort of hypothetical crypto operations, and it's going to be tied to the token, we need to have secure key storage. Um, generally, that means that you can write to, you know, whatever your token is, you can write a random key to it. Once you do that, you can't get it back off. So if I lose the token or something like that, somebody can't extract the key off of it. Um, if it's multi-use and inexpensive as well, then, then that's even better. So there's a couple of different, there's, there's actually more than one hardware token available that will, will meet this uh, kind of requirement. And the, fir the first one is, uh, is a YubiKey. And is anybody familiar with YubiKeys at all? Okay, cool. So, so yeah, YubiKeys are pretty neat. They're these little you know, USB hardware tokens. They look kind of like this. There's actually two form factors. Um, one is a big one that's kind of intended to be carried on your keychain, um, hence the key. Um, the one that you have over there, the little tiny one, is called a Nano. That, that's uh, actually intended more to be left inside of a USB port. You, you kind of jam it in there and it has a very low form factor and you don't take it out. Uh, you, you can get it out, but you generally leave it in. So we have, um, so YubiKeys have been around for quite a while. Um, we've been having kind of a long history with them. We did a little open source project a while ago that got us thinking a little bit about this, which is a project um, called One Time uh, for YubiKey. And what we wanted to do with that um, a brief departure is allow you to do um, time-based one-time passwords like your Google two-factor authentication um, where your secret is actually stored on the YubiKey. So we got into looking at the interface and, and it has a, you know, a suite of onboard crypto functions that you can call. They're practically indestructible. Like you can run over them. They're waterproof. People routinely write in about how they toss them in the washing machine and then dried them for three hours and they still work. Um, and they're inexpensive. Individually, they only cost like 25 for the larger form factor and maybe 40 for the smaller one. Um, but if you buy them in bulk, the, the pricing goes down very considerably there. And the other one that we identified is kind of a new entrant called a uh, dot plug um, or plug up. And these have a very similar kind of form factor. They, they look a little bit like this. They, they actually ship them on what looks like a smart card where it's kind of carved out and you pop it out yourself, fold the little tab over, um, to make it thick enough to fit into a USB port. The, the tricky thing here is they're primarily available. I won't say only available in Europe, but primarily available in Europe. They don't have a really good solution for shipping to the U.S. now. So while, while the, the tokens themselves are only about eight euro, um, when we ended up getting them, they, they were kind enough to give us um, some for free for this particular talk. Um, the, the shipping costs on that ended up being like about $110 to get to the U S uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit, they always get you on the shipping, right? So that, that's a little bit, a little bit skewed, but, um, I think, you know, th they do, they do work and, um, provide very similar functionality to what YubiKey does, um, uh, r really 
with this common denominator that we're taking advantage of. And, and that is the fact that they both provide an onboard HMAC SHA-1 implementation that's callable via a challenge response API. So the idea is that you program your key with one time, you write out your random key data, and then your interactions from that point forward with the hardware token is I'm going to give you some data and you're going to sign it and you're going to give me the data back and you're going to use the secret key that's on the device. You know, I don't know what that is anymore. If you get the device, you're not going to know what it is either. So our simple implementation uh, is, is really to use this onboard token key and HMAC. Um, and, and we want to, we don't want to fundamentally change PBKDF2, right? We don't want to fundamentally change the key derivation algorithm, but we want to say, well, how, how can we enhance it a little bit? And the solution that we've come up with that, that works really well in this case is to permute the database salt before we use it. So if you, if you think back to the approach that we had before, uh, where the salt is, is sitting there, um, public data in the database header, um, we're actually going to take that salt and using a, uh, what we have a provider callback in SQL Cipher, we're going to send the salt into the token, say, you know, HMAC this with the secret key that's on the token that we can't get to and take that data out and pass that in to the key derivation function. So our, our sort of simplified MFA process adds in um, these two factors, which is the token key secret and HMAC SHA-1 and, and uses that to operate to calculate the actual database encryption key. So the general results here, um, you know, really pretty, pretty positive. Um, in fact, you can generate a random key. You can plug it in on both devices. Um, there's different APIs for the two devices, but they're actually interoperable. So you can plug the same, you know, key onto your YubiKey and put it onto your, you know, dot plug. You could spin up five or six of them if you're worried about having backups of that hardware token, you know, put them in a safety deposit box or something of that nature. Um, and you can only open the database if the key is in place in the USB port. Um, in fact, with the more advanced features like the YubiKey has, uh, where you know the, the challenge response API, there's actually a button on the YubiKey. Um, you probably can't see it, but uh, there's actually a, a touch sensor on it. Um, you can program the YubiKey in such a way that in order to complete the challenge response, um, you have to touch it, you know, blinks and you have to touch it for additional security. Um, so, so there's these kind of built in functions as well, but they are interoperable. It provides a very simple implementation. You know, you can't extract the key from the token. And, and importantly, um, in this case, you know, there, there's different ways that you could do this. But one of the important factors here is that we're never really disclosing anything to the hardware. We're not, we're not technically trusting the hardware other than to generate a valid HMAC. Um, we're never sending in anything to the hardware that's secret from the database perspective. We're not giving the, the hardware our password, you know, our database passphrase or encryption key. We're only giving it this otherwise public data and then using the response. So even if the hardware was tampered with or, you know, somehow got swapped out and, you know, ha you happen to get a YubiKey that stores every piece of uh, every message that gets sent into it for later extraction, um, you're never exposing any s actual secret data to the hardware token. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, that's a fair concern. And if it did output zeros every time, um, then you would at worst, you would still have the, the, uh, you know, the protection of the database encryption key. So you'd, you'd still have that operation on it. So, but yeah, yeah. If, if the hardware was tampered with to the point that was always outputting, you know, a static value, then yeah, you, you would lose the, the randomness of the database salt. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly. Yeah. And, and actually we did that, um, as part of, uh, you know, par part of the project when we were kind of going through it. Um, one easy way, uh, we don't have it coded into the library right now, but one easy way to do it is to take, um, and verify when you flash the token, you can actually, you know, you know what the key was at that point in time, and you can execute an HMAC operation with a known good library like OpenSSL and verify that you got the same value out. So, so we, we actually did that during the development process and, it's uh, it's in one of the revisions. It's in, in the code. There's a, a link that we'll publish to GitHub for it. 
within a separate project to survive the adventure? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would probably encourage, you know, at that point, the, the way that you could you could verify that, and you can't definitely verify it, you know, that it will always return in every case, but at the point where you flash it would be a good point to do that. So so both of these devices have a um, have an API that you use to flash them, and, and at that point, you know, you can take whatever random data that you're going to put in, flash it to the device, test that you can get a signature back, validate it with a with a third party implementation, an, an openness cell or HMAC, common crypto, whatever the case is, um, and verify that you're getting good data out of it. Yeah. If it then at a later date decides to do something bad, then you know it's it's tricky. Uh, so cons here, um, I guess that the big the big ones. USB is required for this implementation. So that does kind of limit it to platforms where you have, you know, a USB port in, in place. Um, it makes it difficult to do it on like iOS devices or something of that nature. Um, and in a lot of cases like Android devices, your mobile platforms. But we look at that as a con for right now. But this is sort of, you know, an experimental feature, something that we're thinking about, not, not necessarily something that, you know, people are going to necessarily go out and do today. And a lot of these device manufacturers are starting to go you know, to alternate interfaces, even YubiKey has a, um, they have a, a token which can, uh, it does uh, NFC. So, you know, you have a wireless option to do that challenge response function instead of having it plugged into, um, you know, plugged into uh, the USB port. So this is something that, you know, as the technology improves and there's, you know, additional options um, that are available in the tokens, you know, this stuff will mature and, and it'll probably be more practical to use this sort of, you know, multi-factor, um, uh, multi-factor encryption, uh, scenario with mobile devices. Um, the other cons really involve the fact that you've got a lot of additional code involved. So it's complexity, right? There's custom code that has to be implemented, um, for the SQL Cypher side, there's callbacks, you know, that actually do the, the work of interacting with the, the APIs. And then there's the API dependencies themselves. So just to kind of give you an idea, you know, to implement this for two different functions uh, or two different hardware tokens, you need like the, the Yubico C API, you need the Yubico um, YubiKey personalization API, you need the dot plug API that has a dependency on OpenSSL. So you need to have that in place. They both have dependencies on libusb, uh, and then those have dependencies on, at least on the Mac, on you know I/O kit and and uh, and whatnot. So you've got a pretty steep dependency chain assigned, you know, in, involved with everything related to running it. But once you get it up and running, and, and you know, you can take care of that in, in an automated build process. Um, but you know, th there is a, a certain level of complexity that's inherently involved with with uh, adding a uh, hardware token into the mix here. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, well, outside of iOS and Android, so outside of the mobile, um, but they do support Linux. Uh, both both platforms support Linux, support Windows, and support Mac. So for, for any desktop, you know, environment um, that you would choose to do this, where you might have, you know, some highly sensitive data that you want to put into a SQL Cypher database, um, th this would be doable. Yeah. Uh, isn't there some sort of API or library that would work for Android? like the NFC version? Um, yes, there is an NFC version for Android. I don't have a NFC enabled YubiKey, but um, th there is an NFC API for, for Android. Um, and, and actually, th there's a couple of uh, sample applications that uh, Yubico has published. Uh, I think one that uses uh, one of their NFC tokens for encrypting your open PGP keys. Um, so, so you have to have it in there. So, you, so it's definitely something that is feasible. Um, you know, to, to put into place, but not something that we did as, as part of this uh, uh, experimental feature edition. Cool. So that uh, th that pretty much covers it with the uh, with the multi-factor. There, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Um, we have more information up here. Uh, SQLCypher.net is the website for SQL Cipher. Um, as as Nick mentioned right at the beginning, SQL Cipher is an open source project. Uh, so you can go to GitHub, you can check it out. Um, all of this work related to the adaptive key derivation is all on a, it's all on a branch there called VFS um, that, that's related to the virtual file system that we, we had to implement to 
store the uh, the adaptive key derivations, but you can check it out there. And uh, some of this, the kind of rough, you know, sample code that we use to um, to do the multi-factor encryption um, is is available out there as well under the SQL Cipher MFA uh, repo. Any any questions overall? Sure. There is a uh, open source open where uh, stick out there. I know it was linked in Google Summer of Code, and while it's not really commonly available, mm -hmm. it is something to look at as another possible alternative. Cool. Yeah, I, I think if you look at um, if you look at the MFA project um, and you kind of see how it works, it's really actually very simple. There's uh, the the provider interface in SQL Cipher essentially exposes a bunch of callbacks for common things that it needs to do. So there's like a, there's a key derivation callback, you know, there's an encrypt this data callback, there's a, you know, here's a HMAC callback that we use for, for uh, generating the Macs um, on the pages. Um, and then, you know, there's one in there for, for this, this kind of uh, uh, salt permutation um, and, and whatnot. So you can take that and hook into it. So as long as whatever token that you happen to have, in fact, it wouldn't even have to be a token if you didn't want it to. If you had, if you wanted to rig something up that makes a remote call, you know, to, uh, you know, a re remote call to something, you know, maybe plugged in and plugged into the device, you know, an iPhone or, or whatever the case is, you, you could do it and you just hook into that. As long as it's generating output um, that kind of diversifies the salt coming in um, and, and changes it, then it would work with this approach. So it's very open for you know other implementations and be kind of be kind of neat to see that kind of stuff crop up. I mean, ideally, for for us, SQL Cipher is kind of half. Um, it's it's half uh, you know, business you know because we use it in our own software. We use it in Strip. Um, we also license it to other companies. You know, it's it's open source. We have commercial edition stuff. So we we license it. We do support for it. It's part of our core business. But it's also sort of a a platform where we experiment with ideas you know, like, like this. And if they start to take off and people are interested in it, um, you know, we, we then tend to focus on it. So it's it very much is like requirement driven development for us. You know, what is the community interested in? Um, and you know, are, are people using it? Is it, is it something that makes sense for a practical implementation? And then we kind of take these features and, you know, r run them through and, and, and they stop being experimental and start being real. Cool. And any other questions? All right, great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Oh, one, one other quick thing. If you have any, any other feedback or discussions about SQL Cipher, um, you can hit up that URL as well. Or, or talk to us. Whenever. Talk to us whenever. Yeah, just grab us. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs>